I remember the moment that my life changed very clearly. I was sitting on the ground at a mom's group with my baby in my lap, and I was thinking to myself, last year I was in graduate school talking about really interesting things with really interesting people, and now I'm sitting on the floor singing effing kumbaya, and I think I'm gonna lose my mind. <laughs> I'm an accidental medievalist. That means I studied the Middle Ages, and I've been doing that for about 10 years. Um, but most of my life, I didn't realize that it was going to be a passion for this that was going to get me in front of, well, probably close to a million people. So, when I was a kid, I liked to watch Disney movies, especially Sleeping Beauty and Robin Hood. You know the one with the fox? <laughs> I was on Twitter a couple months ago, and people said, who was a cartoon character that you had a crush on as a kid? And I'm telling you, that fox beat out everybody, except for maybe Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> but watching these Disney movies as a kid, they really spoke to me in a very human way, ironically. Probably my favorite line from Sleeping Beauty is when Prince Philip's father says, you can't marry a peasant, and he says, now, father, you're living in the past. This is the 14th century, nowadays. <laughs> and so you can imagine my disappointment as I started to grow up. I went to school, and I learned that medieval people were stupid. They thought the earth was flat. And they were hyper-violent. They would take off your limbs if you looked at them wrong. And they didn't think for themselves. In hygiene, forget it, right? This period that I loved was a dark and horrible time. And the people in it, they weren't like us. But then, over time, cracks started to form in this impression that I had of the Middle Ages. And I read this story, a novel, in high school, and it was about Robin Hood. And he was a crusader, and he had PTSD. And I thought, that makes a lot of sense to me. Of course you would have PTSD. And then I went to university and I took a course and I realized you can study King Arthur for a living. It's a legitimate career. <laughs> and I also found out that in the Middle Ages, people didn't think that the Earth was flat. True story. They didn't. There's pictures and geometrical equations and stories. There's so much evidence if we just look for it. And I also read this story called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Yes. And <laughs> yeah. And that changed my life. You see, it's a story about a knight and a round table, but it's not a knight versus dragon, knight wins against the dragon type story. Mm -hmm. It's the story of a man who is bound by an oath to take part in a competition he cannot possibly win, mm -hmm. a fatal one. And he's given an out through magic. But if he takes this out, then he has to break a promise to somebody else, and he has to face the fact that he's a coward. And I thought, well, this isn't something that was written during some sort of dark age when people were programmed by the church and, and they couldn't think for themselves. This was a real human story. And I realized that my fox-loving instincts were correct. People in the Middle Ages were like us. And I started to learn whatever I could about that. So fast forward a few years, I'm on the floor, I'm singing Kumbaya, I'm thinking I will never survive motherhood. <laughs> and I get home, and my then husband says, you should take that information that's in your mind, and you should start to write about it. And he had to explain to me what a blog was, because it was that long ago, I didn't know what a blog was. <laughs> so I started a blog called The Five Minute Medievalist. And the idea was that I would talk about things that I thought were interesting, and hopefully I would help people to be medievalists too in five minutes. And the first thing I wrote about was the flat earth. And, you know, this is more than 10 years later, and that's one of the most popular things I've ever written. And it was the first thing I put online. So what I like to do as a five-minute medievalist, and I still write under that name, is to take something that we think we know about the Middle Ages and to give it a human face. So I'll take something like, did people poop in the moat? Which is something that, you know, we were talking about for Moma days. And I will say, yes, people did poop in the moat. And what happened was people would have kind of ensuite closets off of their bedrooms in the castle called garderobes, and they would empty outside the walls. And people will say, oh, that's gross. How could you possibly do that? And then I'll explain that it makes a lot of sense to have this emptying outside the walls. Because if it's emptying outside the walls, it's not collecting inside the walls, which means that nobody has to cart that shit out. Literally. <laughs> Literally. And also, a lot of these moats are 
They're drained by rivers or the sea, and so they're not as nasty as we think, and even if they are, it's great defensively because none of the attacking armies want to swim that shit. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and before we get high and mighty about medieval bathroom habits, how many people do you know will go camping or have a good time in the backyard, and they won't take those extra few steps to go to the bathroom, but they'll pee in the bush, right? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but you know that I see you. We have, we have a lot of misinformation and bad impressions about the Middle Ages. At that time, people read, and they listened to music, and they told jokes, and they made fun of the church, and they went to battle, and they came back with PTSD because they weren't brutes. They were people, and they got traumatized just like soldiers do today. And when they got home, their neighbors noticed the symptoms, and they helped them. Sometimes people married for love, and sometimes people married for money, and sometimes people didn't marry at all because they couldn't be bothered with the hassle. And sometimes they accidentally got married too because in the Middle Ages you could just say, yes, I will marry you. And if you had sex at any time after that, you were legally married. So that was tricky, <laughs> but they figured it out. And people gave their children little knights to play with, and they gave them little pots and pans, and they loved their children so much that they risked their immortal souls by sneaking into the church graveyards at night and burying their unbaptized stillborn children. This is the time that gave us eyeglasses and buttons and gunpowder and musical notation and the printing press. Was everything unicorns and rainbows? Absolutely not. People were horrible to each other sometimes. But if you spoke to somebody from the Middle Ages today and you told them about uh, the last hundred years of our history, they would tell you that sometimes we are horrible to each other too. What I've learned from doing this work is what it takes to see this period with the compassion that it deserves is to look at it with human eyes, not to treat it as a punchline or a stereotype or, or a synonym for something we don't really like. Like, that's positively medieval, right? It's one of the worst insults we could come up with. But if we peel back just one layer, which is usually our modern egos, we can see the human story underneath. So, why is this important? Why does somebody care so much about people who lived a thousand years ago? And how can a really sexy fox cause this much angst? Anyway, well, it's important because we can use exactly the same thinking to learn about any other culture. We can apply it to any culture that's not our own. Those people, they're barbaric. Why are they? What's the human story that we are not understanding underneath? There are lots of people that are working on the Middle Ages, lots of people. So how is it that I got to be somebody who got to be read close to a million times, who got to be listened to well over 100,000 times? Why me? Was it luck? Yes. Was it sheer stubbornness? Probably that too. But I think it's because I see these people not as a punchline. I see these people as wanting to make connections between themselves and us, the people of the future. And so I'll write something in a true story about a monk who's written at the bottom of a thousand-year-old manuscript. I've been writing this all day and my hand hurts, and I just want to drink. <laughs> and someone will read that, and they'll think, that's me. Me too. And all of a sudden, there's a human connection made over the span of a thousand years. And that's magic. So what I wanted to say to you today, my story, your story, all our stories are ones about human connection. Past, present, future. That's what we're all looking for. So maybe it's time for us all to get medieval on how we look at the past and use that idea to connect with the people we are sharing this moment in history with. Thank you.